Task, we good here? Yeah. Okay. Hello, my name is Jeff Fout. Today's date is November 2nd, 2009. I'm interviewing John David Hughes at Ball State University about his experience in the military during the Vietnam era. Good evening, Mr. Hughes, and thank you for Good being evening. here. Good evening. My pleasure. Please say your name and spell it for us, for the record. John David Hughes, H-U-G-H-E-S. D is, yeah, David. Uh, mm. right. Been that way for a while. Been <laughs> Where and what date were you born, sir? April 10th, 1947. Uh, your parents' occupation? My father was a uh, carpenter. Mother was a, uh, well, you call her a uh, housewife, but actually she babysit for a lot of children. Oh. Yeah, some my sisters, but uh, also had several people that she, uh, that worked at the Galco or GM factories and she took care of their children while they worked. And what part of Indiana did you live in, sir? Anderson. Okay. Uh, you mentioned a sister. Did you have any other siblings? Yes. I'm the youngest one out of six. Uh, my brother was the oldest, and there was 20 years difference between us. I've got four sisters in between. Uh, my closest sister is 10 years older than I am. Uh, my brother, <laughs> my brother is gone now, but, but it, the reason I smiled is uh, they used to say he went to Korea and then I went to Nam. Yeah, 20 years separated us, but two wars too, so. And then, uh, I've lost my brother, and I've lost my oldest sister. I have uh, three sisters left now, so. Uh, big family. Uh, since I was, like I said, 10 years uh, junior to everyone, at least, uh, I was always a baby, I was told. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you did you feel because of your brother going to Korea did you feel obligated about joining the military? No, sir. Um, honestly, when I went to high school, I hated it. I hated every minute of it. Uh, as I was like everybody else, kind of silly at that point, too, you know, I could, as soon as I got old enough, I was going to go to work for GM and make all the money I needed and not worry about it. But then, uh, as Vietnam grew, and they called me in for a physical, we asked the gentleman there, uh, all of us that were called in that day, for the physical, draft, selective service physical, how long we had. Well, we went in, I think it was uh, mid-October, just about this time of the year, a little bit, a little bit long, farther along. And he looked at us and uh, he more or less said, well, you guys will be in by Christmas. And that was it. And I thought, I already know how to, to use a, a rifle. I don't need that. I want to uh, do something better, more constructive. So uh, I knew that I wasn't going to be the the brain power behind anything big, but I I figured that I could uh, ha have a lot of mechanical. I'm one of those guys that like to tear things apart and put them back together again and make them work better. So I went and talked to the Air Force recruiter. I joined. And uh, December 1st, 1965, I was climbing on a bus and uh, got as far as Indianapolis. I had a t good friend that I talked him into going with me, and we were supposed to go all the way through BASIC together, right? We made it as far as Indianapolis before they separated us. <laughs> so <laughs> that was typical. <laughs> and... Uh, 
he uh he's one of the guys got a lot of charisma and you know football type and got the looks and everything else anyways and, and he had about uh, I think he's about a quarter Indian blood anyway uh, they end up putting him in uh, Air Force Special Forces actually he went to uh, Ranger School he went through uh, parachute he went through some Special Forces he went through some Green Beret he can do about anything he wants and nobody's going to tell him different. <laughs> anyway, uh, they took him and another one that they trained that way and put them in a mountain yard village in Nam. But uh, Rogers the only one that came out. The other guy in the mountain yards that they trained and, and worked mm -hmm. with, uh, most of them never survived. He uh, was a... Uh, well, you know, so I don't want to use bad word. Let's just say a, a, a ruckus razor. Mm -hmm. um, all the time we were in high school, he was getting in trouble or something. You know, always pushing the envelope. But uh, right now, you'd think he was a, a statue most of the time. He never says a whole lot. Never pushes. I've seen a guy bigger than I am, go after him, and he raised one hand, and the guy's picking himself up off the floor. And uh, after we got out, one time, uh, I went by his house, uh, and he had uh, come over here to Muncie somewhere, and had got into a ruckus, a fight, and... Uh, he said, uh, so they were, guy broke a beer mug across his face. He said he didn't know what happened. He, he wasn't scarred, he wasn't cut. But he said, somebody's going to have to help me get these handcuffs off. He said, they tried to handcuff me, and he said, I didn't mean to. <laughs> so I guess he, they didn't. He just got back in his car and drove home. Uh, Anyway, they end up taking a while to get it, the handcuffs off of him. So nobody pushes him. Uh, it wouldn't do you any good to try to. Where did you take your basic for the Air Force? Lackland. Um, at the time I went in, they had about, I think it was uh, three new four-story brick barracks that had just opened close to where they, what they call the, uh, the, what, the second lieutenant's area, the 90-day wonders, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, they had, Lackland had a lot of uh, World War II era type barracks, and then they had the, uh, uh, the new ones. I was lucky enough to get one of the new barracks, and so, we didn't have to worry about the cracks and the dust and the cleaning as much as what uh, the one thing that uh, I had worked as while I was in high school, worked for uh, Marsh. So I would learned how to use the floor scrubbers and the mops and all that. And I uh, knew how to do all that and I'd also learned a little trick of taking a towel and throw it down underneath the scrubber to get a high shine on the floor. So we kept the floor shiny and uh, our TI never never raised too much cane with us. As long as he could see himself in the floor that he was he was happy. So DI being drill instructor? Yes. Okay. Did what how how was your basic? Did you enjoy it was it just I guess what I'm leading to is you went into jet engines mm -hmm. so after basic were did they assign you jet engines did you request to work on the jet engines how did that process come about I had originally requested that I go into uh, well I like every teenage boy I wanted to mess with automobiles uh, vehicles 
uh, they gave me a uh, test, you know, what is it, uh, English and mechanical and uh, uh, I don't know what all is included in the, the basic test. But uh, I had gotten mediocre on everything except the mechanical, which I'd scored 95 on percent. And uh, they said, well, you're going to go. Uh, to, but instead of going to automobiles, they're going to put me on aircraft. Uh, the first, what is it, it's a six or ten week, I can't remember now. Uh, basic. It's basically they teach you uh, recognizing ranks, uh, normal procedure. They also, you know, break you down supposedly mentally and and teach you to uh, what discipline's all about. Uh, I don't think any of us had anything but left feet as when it came to marching. So I don't know. We we always end up hearing about it. So. Uh, <laughs> But when I finished basic, they sent me to uh, Chinook, Rantoul. And that is the uh, basic aircraft maintenance uh, training school, which is over here, uh, what, about 25 miles north of uh, Champaign, Illinois. Okay. I could run home on weekends, uh, I caught a ride and I could come home once in a while. But the thing was, uh, at the time I went in, they were operating a uh, school around the clock. And my shift was that I I went in at uh, about 7 o'clock in the evening and was finished with classes about 5 in the morning. So I would go in and have breakfast and then go back to barracks and sleep until about 2 in the afternoon. And then uh, that's when our next go-round would go. And uh, I enjoyed the classes or the things so much. Uh, I never even opened a book. I just sat there in class and picked up everything I needed to pick up. and. Uh, scored good on all the tests, so uh, the only time I end up opening the book or review any of my notes was the night before we had our final. I went down through and just read through all the notes I had. And uh, I graduated after tech school. They uh, gave me a permanent change of station, which was uh, the scenic, beautiful state of South Dakota and uh, Ellsworth, and it put me on SAC base on uh, Jet Over 2, which was uh, KC-135s, EC's, B-52s. Uh, but basically, I could uh, operate, or I knew, understood the theories and the everything and uh, for gas turbine engines. Uh, that's one thing they teach you how to, to, to learn. And then with the Air Force at the time, what they do is uh, they give you like a home study, a progressive learn system. So while you are in the field getting used to uh, uh, working on the aircraft, you're also learning from a book or a series of books to teach you how to uh, properly do the means. Well, I lucked out. When I got to South Dakota Ellsworth, the wing was TY. So we had a basic skeleton crew, both in the maintenance area and, on, well, on the whole base. Because when they ship every, the wing over, everybody goes. And they gave me to a, I didn't know at the time, an old staff sergeant. He was getting ready to retire, and that man set me up uh, that I owe him so much. But what he said, he said, uh, you're coming into work, you're going to work all day. He said, at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, you're going to sit down at this desk, and you're going to go through a book. 
He said, you're going to go through this book every afternoon that way for four days. And after Friday, you're going up to headquarters and you're going to take a test on that book or that chapter, that area. So I did. I went through all that, studied them, went up, took the test, got a 90 percent. And uh, finished all the training. And I start, I was working on... Uh, regular jet engines. I was working on the wing commander's personal aircraft, which was the old uh, P-80, like Shooting Star. It's a trainer, actually, actually now, or at that time was. <clears throat> but that's what he used to go from South Dakota to Omaha, Nebraska, for SAC. That was his personal transport. But when it came time to do work on his air, uh, aircraft, they had a what they, I called a... Uh, I worked in what they call the accessory shop. In other words, uh, his aircrafts, uh, MA-1A air carts that they used to start all the aircraft with, their small gas turbine, APUs that they use on the KC-135s, which is auxiliary power units that provide all the electricity and heat and air conditioning when they first start or sitting on the ground before the engine starts. We did uh, maintenance on different parts, mostly uh, stuff that we could redo were uh, like fuel manifolds. Uh, they could be rebuilt in the field, uh, which was basically an atomizer as a spray jet. You had six of them to a cluster and eight clusters. You had eight combustion cans and an engine. And each one of those, and you set it on a a uh, test facility with a uh, clear Lexan or plastic glass cover and then you pressurize it with a like a cleaning fluid you let it run for 25 minutes and then you go back and you check the spray patterns that are coming out of each nozzle and if there is one that's not spraying evenly and completely you shut it down pull that nozzle out put a new one in try it again and uh, uh, then other things that just happened, whatever uh, they wanted cleaned or fixed. I, uh, like I said, I worked on the MA-1 air carts, which uh, after about three or four months, I picked up enough that I could tweak them and tune them in so that I could get the max amount of air pressure out of each one. I learned how to, to uh, uh, get them to run properly and then uh, uh, it wasn't long after that and the wing came back and we started in uh, but since I had finished the follow-up training with the Air Force uh, home study system CDC I think they called it uh, as I got time and grade I got a promotion and I found out later that a lot of the guys never even bothered with that home study. They were there to spend their time, and that was it. They were looking for a short distance. And uh, when I turned 21 and made staff sergeant and uh, became a crew chief, all those guys that hadn't done anything were still airmen seconds and airmen thirds or buck sergeants mm -hmm. they suddenly realized that they should have done something and of course nobody cared too much for me about that time either so I would like to go back and what does SAC stand for SAC mm -hmm. strategic air command okay now after you had completed your studies did you know that you were going to be deployed I was going to be what deployed did deployed you? uh yeah, everyone was going. I mean, they were rotating everyone, uh, every wing, Dover, Fairchild, uh, Homestead, every place that was equipped with B-52s, D models especially, or uh, KC-135s, even ECs, uh, electronic control measures, EC aircraft. 
they were all taking shifts. Uh, some were 60 days shifts, and some were what they called 180 day or six month shift. Uh, my Thailand was 180 day. My Guam was a 60 day uh, temporary. They they pay you when they send you over there on temporary duty. They pay you travel pay, so many cents a mile, you know, uh, to get you over there. But what they don't tell you is, you're in there as a temporary duty. You don't get the hazardous duty pay. You don't get the extra clothing allowance. You don't get the jungle fatigues. You don't get the jungle boots. You don't get the weapons. You don't get the uh, special allowances. You're there to support an aircraft as you walked in the same way as that thing landed. You are equipped with what you had on or what you brought with you. Nothing extra. So all the guys that went on permanent change of station or PCS to Thailand or Guam or all, both, mostly it was in uh, Thailand. They got the jungle boots, the jungle fatigues, uh, which are lighter, which means you don't, you're not sweating mm -hmm. all the time. Uh, they got hazardous duty pay. They got uh, a special clothing allowances. They got uh, all the extra money, and uh, we just just like that we were sitting here in the states working all the temporary duty people. What were the? Could you describe to me the two main planes that you worked on? The B fifty two bomber, but you said it was the D class. D model. What What did that mean? D model uh, was in the uh, what early sixties, mid sixties was the uh, uh, prime example. I mean, it still had the uh, machine guns with a tail gunner in the back, uh, like an old B seventeen or something. It had certain amount of electronics, but it didn't have the uh, radar uh, canceling or radar jamming situation. It's like the old uh, uh, ones that in Dr. Strange love. That that B-52 was like a D model. When they jumped to the H models, or G and H models, they upgraded from the uh, uh, turbo gas turbine engine to a turbofan engine which is actually the first three or four stages of a turbofan engine have extra long vanes and cause it to be highly efficient. It's almost like adding a propeller on the front of a, a jet engine. That's what you're basically doing. You get more power, you get more efficiency, you get less fuel burn, you get uh, also they would give um, a terrain following they aim uh, extra uh, radar capabilities. They did away with the uh, tail gunner in the back. It was all uh, electronically controlled. Uh, what they had was still a uh, like a minigun, I think, back there then. So that's basically the same as what they have today. I think the H model is the latest one that are still flying 52s. Were these the ones used primarily for all of the bombing runs the in Vietnam? D-models, D-models. For the bombing runs in Vietnam? Yes. Uh, those are the ones where uh, back in the late 50s, early 60s, they used to have what they called the hound dog missiles, which was slung underneath the wing of the B-52. They were about the size of a small jet aircraft and they actually had a jet engine but they carried a nuclear weapon in the nose and what they would do is they, the idea was that uh, they'd go up and the B-52 could sit outside the border of a country and fire the hound dog and the hound dog would fly in unmanned on a planned route. Well when they changed over to the D model, they took the pylons that used to carry the hound dogs and they turned them into uh, racks for 500 pounders. And uh, you would carry uh, 
12 500 pound bombs on a rack underneath the wing. Then you carried your other 1,000 pounders or more 500 pounders in the uh, uh, bomb racks that went into the belly of the aircraft. And all this was electronically controlled. You watch, uh, uh, watch them load bombs on a B-52 like we did in, uh, in Thailand. They have a 40 or 45 foot semi flatbed with six by six, looks like uh, railroad rails going up the length of the thing. And on those two six by sixes are these 500 pound bombs, one laying beside the other all the way up, all the way the length of that trailer. And uh, they would take what they call a, uh, a bomb dolly, a little mechanical arm, the hydraulics thing, and they would pick up the bomb off the back of a semi-trailer, run over, and as he's going, he's lifting it up to the proper height. And there's a guy, a couple of guys standing on step ladders over here by the wing. And by the time he gets there, he's got it at the right height, and they just slip the pin in. So as soon as he, they more or less wink at him or nod, he drops that arm, and he's on his way back to pick up the next one. And uh, this happens constantly. Well, what you don't see is the guy on the flatbed, after about the first five or six bombs, he's sitting there, and as soon as that guy pulls away from the back of the semi, he reaches over and kicks the next bomb, and the bomb starts rolling down those six-by-sixes. And by the time it gets to the end, ready to drop off, this guy's back over here with the carrier, catches it, <laughs> and he backs it up, lifts it, and goes... <laughs> Uh, did I that make you a little nervous watching those bombs going? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there's it. It uh, those guys were good. I mean, and they load the bomb wa uh, racks in and so forth, and uh, they were good. Once in a while, they would wire them up backwards on the racks, and uh, instead of the bombs falling from the bottom to the top, they fall from the top to the bottom, and it's like. Uh, you can imagine all the pool balls trying to get into one pocket. Okay. Uh, when that happens, these things are all jamming up and everything <laughs> else. And on Guam, we actually had a 52 come back with a uh, a bomb stuck in the do in the bomb bay doors. The uh, nose of it had p had cleared the wire and was loose. Uh, it had arm diffuse, but by the time it had fallen, the doors were automatic. They had doors that had come down and grabbed it right behind, right in front of the fins. So the fins were what was holding it inside the doors. And uh, the pilot went ahead and came in and landed, but by the time he brought it to a stop out of the uh, eight large tires, he had one that was still old in the air. The rest of them had blown. The bomb had fell loose when he touched down and went underneath the rear landing gear and blew out all the tires. And he kept nudging the brakes trying to get it to stop before it ran out of runway on Guam. Guam, the runway comes clear up to the side of a cliff and then drops. And about uh, a mile and a half off that, there's a Russian trailer sitting there always or was, and he, that Russian trawler would keep track of how many aircraft took off, what time they left, okay. everything like that. Uh, the only thing that I ever saw that didn't go to the end of the runway was uh, U-2s. U-2s would be airborne mid-runway and go straight up. That Russian trawler couldn't even, didn't even know which way he would turn when he got to the altitude. So they couldn't tell which way he was going, if he was going back to the States, if he was going to overseas somewhere or what. The U-2s being our spy, our spy planes, correct? Yes. Was Guam your first tour of duty overseas? Yes. And that was 60 days, correct? Yes. Could you describe to me a typical day? Uh, 
Yeah, basically, is uh, everyone wanted to wake up basically about the same time, first thing in the morning. <coughs> Excuse me. You uh, hit the shower, dress, and uh, depending, after a while, you learn, you know, you you got to get some breakfast. You couldn't survive until noon without eating something. And you go to chow hall, and then uh, you walk to uh, the uh, hangar, maintenance hangar, where you worked. And then you would, they would call you or ring the alarm so that you could go to lunch at 11, come back by 11.30 or 12, work again. At 4 o'clock, they would ring again, and you'd trot off to, to the barracks. And you'd uh, either get supper and go back and read or swap war stories with a group of guys. Either that or most of the time you uh, end up going by the NCO club or the Airmen's club and uh, drink a little beer and swap war stories there. Did you, now these had, you had B-52s you were working on? Did you also have the KC-135 tankers? Yes. Did they, was it almost an 8 to 5 job? 7 to 4, but uh, when we were working in South Dakota, we were working 12 hours a day, 7 days a week. Uh, you have to have X number of engines ready what they call on the ready line okay if uh you had uh you know uh eight engines where you're assigned allotment for tankers you had eight eight of those you had uh, uh three engines that could swap off for a left or a right engine on b-52 but b-52s also had what they call shotgun starters on uh on two of the engines, which was uh, if a B-52 lands someplace they don't have an MA-1A air cart, they have something that looks like a, a two-pound coffee can full with black powder, and it fits into a breech, and when the pilot hits the switch, it gives it an electrical charge and causes it to go off like a rocket, and it blows against the turbine like a turbocharger and cranks the engine over and gets it going so that you get air flowing and get uh, get it started. Once you get one engine going, you can tap onto it, pull the air off of it, and fire up the next one. Pull the air off of the two and fire up the third one. Pull the air off of three and fire up the fourth one on that wing. Then you did the opposite on the next wing. The right wing would be the same way. You had a shotgun starter or there was a way that you could dump air across from the other other ones, but the pilots, if he's going to burn one powder charge, he might as well hit, hit the other one too. So if you had you had an allotment of engines that were to be worked on and, if, and to get them back up and running, and if you had those done, then you hit downtime? Supposedly, yeah, you got downtime. What you've got to remember, too, is that uh, here in the States, we had what they call a priority five for parts. Uh, you need an, I've seen sit and work, wait for two weeks for a little rubber O-ring for uh, an oil seal for a bearing on the inside of a jet engine. And the engine would sit there for two weeks waiting and Everything in Southeast Asia, everything over there, had priority one. Government, I would assume, like the president's plane and so forth, were all priority twos or threes. And normal uh, priority for any uh, stateside base was five. So you're fifth on the list automatically for parts. If they have 10 parts and nine of them go overseas, every base in the United States is waiting their turn for that number 
five or tenths part to be divvied up to whoever it gets up. Okay. So the priority was to keep these bombers in the air and uh, have us X number of engines sitting in a ready line in case one of the engines blows or sucks in a bird or uh, picks up a rock. Uh, a good trick was uh, uh, a penny. I've seen a, a vane, jet engine vane, that had the impression of Lincoln's head off a penny and printed into the metal because it the vein was traveling so fast and it sucked that penny up and hit that blade enough. But the trouble is when it does that, that blade also breaks and the one next to it breaks and that one takes two and those two take four and the next four take eight and the next eight takes sixteen and it just cleans out the inside of an engine. Well, the first thing the engine condition guys are going to do, they're going to drop the engine, come in there, grab one of our ready engines, run out there, throw it on the aircraft, and say, tell the pilot, you're good to go. We're stuck with chasing down parts, pulling parts. Uh, I have seen a complete engine disappear because people would cannibalize parts off of it and put them on other engines to get it to go. And by the time they shipped off the damaged parts to have them repaired, there was nothing else to go back to the old cannibalized engine. And what you have is you have what they call an engine can, which is about six foot in diameter and about 12 or 14 foot long that splits lengthwise. And they put a jet engine down inside that can. It's got a rubber seal around it. You bolt the top down on it, the other half of the can, pressurize it three pounds of air pressure or five pounds of air pressure, and you take the record, slide it in a tube and sh on the end of the can and ship it off via truck to Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma City where those guys will take and rebuild the engine completely from one end to the other, new bolts, nuts, you name it, they'll do it. But those... I'd say 65, 75 percent of them were civilians. Those were not military. They also had all the repair facilities for the turbine wheels, the vanes, the fuel controls, the hydraulic pumps, the generators, the alternators, whatever it took to repair an engine, they could do it right there. They had the parts and the skills to do it. And I've seen nothing more than about three or four hydraulic lines, an air line, and what they call a data plate, which is a little metal shield about so long and about that wide. And on the side, just like a data plate you see on the car door, mm -hmm. it has the engine number, what it is exactly, like a J57-1929 or 59, depending on whether it's a 19 and 29 in a bomber engine, the 59 is a tanker engine any of those numbers and the production date and who made it. Uh, Pratt and Whitney used to make the J57s mostly but they also contracted them out to Ford so you actually had Ford producing J57 jet engines and uh, I've seen nothing but that piece of scrap metal and a few tubes go into a can with the paperwork stuck in the end shipped off pressurize it to five degrees or five pounds air pressure and ship it. As long as they got the data plate, that's all they were worried about. Now this is on Guam? That, no, this was South Dakota. Oh, this was in This okay. was swap. This all is right. stealing parts from the engines there just okay. to try to, you steal parts from one engine to get three running maybe. I see. See? I'm, I'm going to shift us back to, to when you were in Guam. Oh, there? Guam was a regular eight-hour day. Yes. Okay. Now, after the Guam, is it, is it, did I read this correctly that you were there while when they brought out the last Japanese soldier out of the, the jungles of Guam? I worked with a guy here. There's a place over here off of Broadway. It used to be a place called uh, City Machine. Uh-huh. Uh, 
I worked in there. I did CAD work, a design work, special tooling and so forth for uh, uh, Dana up in Fort Wayne for rear axles, semi-trailers or semi... Anyway, there was a guy that worked there. He came out of Columbus, Indiana. He came on contract, worked up here. And he was one of the APs on Guam that went in there to get that last wow. Japanese soldier that was still out there walking around, you know, finally gave up. And it's like uh, uh, this guy said, he said, this, this guy was strange after 20 years of being stuck in a cave. Uh -huh. And uh, he said a lot of guys on Guam don't realize what kind of snakes and everything else are out there in those jungles crawling around until you go out there and start kicking bushes and leaves trying to figure out, you know, where this guy's at. And he said that every, one, every once in a while they'd have you go out there and, and, you know, stir up. He said it was nothing for him to uh, uh, redo a baseball diamond, a mud mound or something like that, be digging away and flip up a mortar shell or, uh, you know, a live round that had been buried in the mud and had been there for years and years and years. And uh, whether it's a mortar shell or an artillery shell or whatever it happened to be, uh, he said that uh, they had one baseball game where a kid was out on a pitcher's mound kicking the dirt and started feeling something. He kept kicking and kicking, and he kicked up a mortar shell that had been buried in the, on the pitcher's mound. And he said that was, you know, that's that's just normal. Yeah. I mean, I went downtown in a place called Ogana or uh, on Guam. And Guam is kind of strange. The road ran right along by the beach. And you had, uh, they have foundations. Once they pour concrete, it's like they, the concrete's going to stay there forever. I mean, uh, you had a foundation and a foundation with weeds in it and weeds in it and then a building sitting on this one. And then there'd be two empty foundations and then, you know, and you sit in this bar, an old bar, and you look out the front window and the door and there sits a Japanese pillbox. Still got a concrete pillbox sitting on the beach, 75, 100 foot away from you. <laughs> this is in 60s. Six, sixty-seven. So yeah, you see all kinds of weird stuff. <laughs> how was the, how was your transition from from being a civilian, and all of a sudden you're over in Guam, and then Okinawa, and finally Thailand. The uh, from Indiana to these uh, different <laughs> countries, half of half a world away. Look, well, I tell you what. Let me let me ask you this, and I'll kind of flip it around on you a little bit. How do these kids act like when they come out of a a country home and come to school here in a, a from a little whistle stop town to a city that's got uh, all kinds of restaurants and stores and stuff? Yeah, it kind of takes their breath away at first, probably. Uh, gives them a while, but once they get their feet on the ground, they suddenly decide, you know, and then they're going to see how far this envelope is going to stretch. And that's the way it was with the military. How far can I go before somebody slaps me on the wrist and says, that's enough? Well, some guys won't, you know, figure that out before it happens, before the slap comes along. <laughs> and other guys come along, and they don't care how many times you slap them. <laughs> They're going to do what they want to do. And that was it, basically. You, uh, like South Dakota, you spend two weeks in South Dakota, and you've seen South Dakota one end or the other. There's nothing there. Once you've gone to Mount Rushmore, you've driven through the, hill, the Black Hills, you go to the Badlands, you see the pretty rocks and the dust and the dirt, and you see uh, the Indians and so forth. 
okay, that's all gone. We're happy. We've seen it. We've taken our pictures. We've written home about it. Now what do we do? You do like everybody else does. You go down to the local bar and you sit there and play pool and you drink. And you hope that somebody will either cart you home or drive you home and you'll survive. That was part of why we worked 12 hour days, seven days a week. Because our wing commander told us he couldn't figure out how we could work 12 hour days, seven days a week and still get out of town and get in trouble. <laughs> and, and, but, but he's the one one time when we had an ORI, Operational Readiness Inspection, they give you X number of minutes to find, to get X number of aircraft in the, in the air, bombers. And uh, they had down, got down to the last aircraft, and they had an engine that wouldn't fire or wouldn't start. The starter was bad, and it's, it had broke a sure shaft. And one of our engine con guys grabbed the inspector, took him over and started showing this other <clears throat> engine or this other detail. While he was over there doing, met, doing that, another engine con guide grabbed a starter and changed the starter on the engine. <laughs> All quicky, quicky, quiet, quiet like, you know. And they got the engine started and they got the aircraft in the air. Well, that makes all the officers happy, 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 happy. Anyway, they come down to our squadron commander, the maintenance squadron commander, was major. And uh, he came in one day and he was telling us, you know, he was very proud of us for passing the ORI and helping the uh, bomb wing get the right number of aircraft in the air and uh, had made uh, everybody happy. and. You knew somebody was going to get a nice pat on the back and an extra star or something. But uh, he said, I've got a problem, though. And uh, the doors slid open on the end of the hangar, and this uh, step van, which is what they use for maintenance, was backing in. We figured, well, there comes an engine con truck. They're going to be bringing in a, another engine before long. The Major said, I've got this problem. He said, I've got this keg in this truck that's got a broken <laughs> spigot, and I need somebody to help me drink it real quick. <laughs> and he threw the doors open, and there was two kegs sitting in a wash tub with ice down, ready to go. And he was. He, the spigot was turned on, and there was no shutting it off. <laughs> and they emptied both those kegs. <laughs> anyway, the the Major was a happy guy he didn't care uh, he was a Korea veteran who had been coming up through the ranks mm. and he had been passed over three times he was getting ready to retire he didn't care so he was hey let's do it and everybody sat there and then that was the way it was we had uh, what they call I don't know how they did it but on like on special holidays in the summer and so forth there's a place up there called Lake Sheridan, which is a uh, mountain lake fed with mountain water. Temperature of about, oh, I'd say 52 degrees, something like that. It's constant. And what they would do is would they take off and they go up there and they have sleeping bags and trash cans full of beer iced down. And they would, everybody in the shop would jump in cars and go up there. And they'd sit there all night with fire and hot dogs and whatever and, and drink beer and tell war stories and so forth. And somebody would get plastered. They had this little guy from Milwaukee. Had a little MGB. And they would take the guy and they'd put him on the hood of this MG midget, B or whatever. One guy was in the pasture side holding his right hand. The guy in the driver's side was holding his left hand and they'd spring this guy over the hood of the car and they'd drive like this down around heading right straight for the lake and they'd get to going about 40 mile an hour or so and they'd get to the edge of the lake and everybody let loose this guy and they'd <laughs> slam on the brakes. <laughs> 52 degrees he would he would sober up in nothing flat. <laughs> 
<laughs> anyway, that's how you spent a, a holiday weekend. Holiday Drinking beer, partying, campfires, war stories, you name it. We've got to change the tape, if you give me just a second, and then I want to come back and talk about... Okay. Okay. Well, let's go back and discuss that some more. You said you're, you had a Civil War. If you could tell me more about that, you had an ancestor that was in the Civil War? Yes, my great-grandfather was James C. York. He uh, was one of the guys that took the place of another man, uh, a gentleman named Hammond. He went, uh, Hammond had joined the service and then ch backed out, chickened out, said he didn't, he couldn't do it. My grandfather went in and took his place, even signed his name and collected his pay. And, uh, uh, I've got the stuff where he wrote a letter later applying for the uh, military benefits. Uh, my grandfather, James York, owned a lot of land in Kentucky, Albany, Kentucky. As a matter of fact, Lake Cumberland is over the top of some of our land, or his land. And the York Creek and uh, my mother was born and raised on a place uh, called Malone Ridge in Kentucky. And about, I think it's seven or ten miles south of there is where Alvin York lived, which was my great-grandfather's nephew. His brother, Thomas, Thomas York, I believe it was, uh, was Alvin's father. Anyway, uh, uh, I've got got pictures. My sister is getting into genealogy pretty, pretty heavy and covering a lot of this, and she's found most of this and got uh, the census records and so forth and printed records. I've got uh, a copy of the uh, Kentucky marriage contract for my grandparents. Uh, my grandmother... My mother's mother. Uh, my was on, my mother was only like seven or eight years old when she passed, and she said she thought that she had diabetes or something because she kept getting weaker and weaker and weaker. And then my grandfather remarried, and uh, wasn't long after that that they moved up here to Newcastle. And uh, my parents, uh, my mother had married a gentleman named uh, Dickon, and she was only 16, and uh, that's my brother was born, and he was killed. Uh, he was in a, um, like a horse trainer, and he had stamped, stamped by a horse and killed. My father and mother knew each other and then he married her. This is back in the uh, 20s. And uh, they started a family and my dad took my brother as his. And then they started their own family. And uh, my father was a carpenter. Uh, and when he came to Anderson, and my grandfather, my mother's father, worked at GM in Anderson. Uh, he also had worked at Ingersoll Rand in Newcastle. He had worked at uh, the old Maxwell Automobile Company in Newcastle. My father had worked there driving uh, kingpins with a sledgehammer for uh, uh, front axles on the Maxwell. Uh, I got pictures of him. I know that the house that he lived in is, is still standing in Newcastle. I've been there. Uh, my mother's father, my grandfather, 
was one of three brothers. One brother stayed in Kentucky, one came here, and the oldest one went west. A couple years back, we found my cousins in Dallas, Texas, and I've met him, and he's been to a reunion and everything else. He was in the Air Force and flew as a radio a radar operator who worked for Hughes Aircraft in Dallas, Fort Worth area. His uh, his father, which was the brother, lived in uh, north of Dallas, up toward Oklahoma, in Oklahoma City, and uh, uh, that whole bunch is kind of what. You start talking about down south, and you're talking about big family all over the place. I've got relatives down there that I have no idea what their names are or anything else, but I know the Elmore name down there is uh, is uh, in that particular town. Everybody knows them. I got cousins down there. I while I was working here after I got out of service from Marsh. I got talking to a truck driver one day, come to find out he's a cousin. <laughs> His name was Elmore. And I said, I got a grandfather's name was Elmore. And he said, really? I said, yeah. Well, turns out that his father and my mother are direct cousins. Wow. So uh, he's retired now. He's back down in Kentucky. So uh, Kentucky is, uh, is a... Uh, is home to a lot of people around mm -hmm. this area. I taken classes about three or four years back to talking out here at Ivy Tech and talking to a gentleman that's taking a writing class and I told him I said I'm the first generation out of the hills so take it easy on me and he wanted to know where I was from and I said Albany Kentucky and he said you ever hear of a little town called Bargetown? I said yeah it's about four or five miles away from Albany he said, yeah, he said, that's where I'm from. Hmm. So he's a principal of the grade school in Newcastle. Well, let's, let's go to Okinawa. Yes. You've go, you gone from Guam. Was your next station of duty Okinawa? Yeah, I uh, was sent there originally. I was there for only about three or four days. Um, since I wasn't put to work, I went downtown to see what was going on. I mean, Okinawa is a uh, uh, another oriental type society. Uh, they more or less, the feeling I got was, uh, uh, as long as you had cash, you, you could talk to them and you could do whatever you wanted, you know, more or less. But you go to a bar and, and it's like uh, all the orientals that were over there they had their rock bands and they could sing and they duplicated the pop songs of the time and could and could uh, copy them almost exactly. Uh, cool. It wasn't like I said. I they they never put me to work. I went to the the hangar and they would send me back to the barracks, uh, and then that's when they told me to to repack and they sent me to Utapau which was on the, uh, in Thailand. Okay. When you arrived in Thailand, were you, how long had you, had you, had you had your rank as staff sergeant? I was only a sergeant then. I wasn't a staff. Okay. Uh, I was still less than 20, less than 21 years old. Okay. Um, when I got there, they were still building the base. As a temporary or TDY guy, we got the low always get the low rung on the ladder, so I moved into what they call the hooch, which is a concrete base two by four and ten, uh, ten roof, top half screen, bottom half shutter, ten shutters that was sprung out like this on sticks to get air flowing, and you laid in the beds in there I mean you actually they gave you beds and so forth you had a had a locker but the thing is, is uh, the hooches were all within 
100, 150 yards flight line. So 24 hours a day, you always had jet engines running. Uh, I was always around uh, uh, the noise that way. And not until I had been there for about four months did we actually get to move to one of the new barracks, like I showed you a picture of here, uh, which was a multi-story, what, three-story concrete with uh, screens and lures. And basically what they had done is they'd used lockers to divide them off into sections, and you had about uh, eight, twelve guys in a, in a section with beds and lockers. And um, that's basically how life was. You'd get up and go down to the base or to the shop and work. That was unusual because Thailand, you work six hour days, four days a week. And the other three days you spent doing whatever you could find to do, including going downtown and drinking. Given the, the location of Thailand to Vietnam and the heavy bombing that the United States was involved in, I would think, was, was not that base busy all of the time? Yes. It, uh, if you look at the picture there, the, the rear tail fin, mm -hmm. when you look on uh, Guam or on Thailand, either one, you look out, they're all sitting on st in strafe uh, shelters, uh, walls about, what, 20, 18, 20 foot high. And you can't see that much of the wing and the aircraft, but you can see those tails. And it would look like a humongous school of sharks when you look out across the jungle. That rear tail fin sticking up. They were all kinds. I mean, when I was on Guam, I sat there one evening after work, and they take off three aircraft, three minutes, three more aircraft, three minutes, three more. I sat there for 45 minutes while they did that. Three aircraft take off, three minutes later, three more take off. Three minutes later, three more take off. And that's... Uh, I don't know what what offensive or what area they were bombing, but they it was uh, constant. But you're when did you become a staff sergeant? When did you became a staff sergeant? Uh, about six months before I got out. Okay, I guess my my question is, even though we are involved in this heavy bombing of Vietnam. You guys still worked those hours, so they had twelve-hour days. Twelve-hour days. Okay, so yeah. this, this is when you were really now they, constantly. They, we, if there was nothing for us to do, I mean, very rarely you always had some kind of engine work had to be right. done. You would pick six or seven guys, and they would go around what they call uh, for fod for an object damage. They would pick up nuts and bolts and rocks and pieces of wire, anything on the floor, so that it wouldn't be kicked up or picked up or accidentally get inside an engine. They would walk from these uh, about an eight foot long by a three foot wide, three tiered little uh, cart on rollers. And that's where you would put all the parts that you removed off an engine on these container or on these carts. Every opening had to be taped shut with either something like duct tape or masking tape. Nothing was left open to allow anything to be hidden, crawled into it or whatever. Nothing that would end up causing damage. You spent days walking around, picking the floor, picking the lines and hydraulic lines and so forth and sealing them up. You also had covered cabinets like that with three tiers that uh, were put against a wall and long-term maintenance engine parts like uh, pneumatic 
ducts about six inches in diameter and ranging in length up to, I don't know, 10 foot, would be Y, they get a Y split that would be mounted in two points on, a, on an engine. Those go into the containers and on the outside those would be marked as for such and such an engine, such and such a crew chief, uh, don't bother. And you couldn't take it, excuse me, and use it for another engine or anything, see, supposedly. But what uh, a lot of the guys would do is uh, you would have, you'd always have a few uh, skaters and uh, they liked those covered bins like that. They would crawl in on the bottom shelf, close the, have the buddy close the door after them and put, drop the pin in to close the doors and they'd lay in there and sleep for four <laughs> or five hours at a time. As a, as when you did reach a rank as staff sergeant, how many airmen were under your command? I had a crew of four guys. I had uh, uh, three good workers and a I don't know, I wouldn't say he he's probably a good worker, but he was an individual. Uh, he uh, had a lot of feminine, feminine qualities. He liked uh, paperwork. He liked uh, uh, to be left alone. So a lot of guys would just do that, and, and that was Fonzie. He was a good guy, no problem. I mean, nobody cared. They gave him a hard time. They put him on a test cell when he first got there after after about the first couple of days of dealing with him. What What is test cell? Where you take an engine after being overhauled or they put, you on, put it on a test cell and they pipe fuel to it and they fire it up. Okay. And it's clamped down on a, on a rail system and it won't let the engine move. But what uh, it's got a funnel shaped... Uh, directional vent that slides up on the back of the the uh, uh, engine. The engine runs and they can take it all the way up to, to max power and back down again. Anyway, they put him on the test cell out there and told him to stand ground, which means while the engine's running, he's out there walking around the engine looking for oil leaks or whatever. Anyway, a jet engine will never reach 100%. They don't run by RPM. They don't run by, by uh, uh, that way. They run by an engine pressure, pressure ratio, which is no engine will ever reach 100%. If it ever reached 100%, there's nothing to keep it from going to 110, 120, 130 it would 98 or 99 percent is the best you could ever get out of an engine they idle at around 60 to 65 percent of their total power so when you're in an aircraft in a jet aircraft and you feel the pilot shut the throttles forward and it throws you back mm -hmm. he's only using 30 percent of that power that that engine has you don't get or you don't uh, get all of it anyway the fuel control on a jet engine will is slow. It constantly takes physical pressure from into air coming in and exhaust temperature and air pressure going out and uh, temperature, air temperature, everything controls. So the fuel control moves slow. Well, they had Bonzi standing there, and he says. Step back a little bit, Bonzi. He said, I'm going to seal the oil rings, oil seal, which are pressed carbon. And once you soak them with oil, supposedly, you keep the engine from uh, breathing or getting a positive airflow in a pressurized system. You don't want an airflow. You want it to be liquid pressure. So they would take this throttle and you go wham 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 like that, 
back and forth, full open, close, full open, close, full open, close, back and forth. Well, when it does that, the engine's always a couple steps behind you. And it expands and it contracts and it expands and it contracts. It would actually separate seams on the cases. You can actually have fire shoot out of the seams. And the engine will flex against the flex plates that are bolted down to hold the engine to keep it from flying out the end. Well, when they did that, Bonzi was on the ground set wired to the to the cell house. Anyway, they said they looked out the window and all I could see was that wire stretched out here like a clothesline <laughs> out in front of that engine. <laughs> anyway, he. he they moved him from the test cell back inside. <laughs> it was he like I said, he was a good guy. He he could fill out paperwork and orders and so forth. He he, he enjoyed that, he liked it. So everybody the whole thing was that you just yell Bonzi and somebody would tell you where he was at. <laughs> you know. But I then I had a I had a guy from Chicago I had a guy from Alabama, and I had a uh, uh, another guy um, uh, from uh, Wisconsin. The guy who was from Alabama was good at putting intakes on an engine, small little seven or three eighths inch nuts hold the uh, intake on a B fifty two, a bunch of them all in a row like this. And once you put them on there and you torque them down, you've got to safe to wire each one a certain way. And he could get his hands in there and do it perfectly. The guy from Chicago, his last name was Hughes, like mine. So, and he was a good guy. I mean, you know, he good worker. He could go underneath the engine. He'd change fuel control. Fuel controls, hydraulic pumps, uh, alternators. He could he could do all that from and knew how to get them all plumbed and wired and and uh, clamps on them to keep from chafing. And then the uh, other two guys or the other guy was good for the back end of the engine. He could split the tailpipe or split a, a rear hot suction down, break it down to the turbine wheels and so forth with no trouble. He knew how to go about it, how to take the measurements and check the, the spacing so that you make sure the turbine wheels fit the right distance away from the nozzle. If you put it too close, the engine runs hot. If you put it too far away, the engine runs uh, or slow. It speeds up, excuse me, and then runs hot. Speeds up too close, hot when it's, when it's too far away from the nozzle. So you had all the confidence with your airmen. Yes. Did your yourself and the other airmen on base keep up with what was going on in Vietnam? Were there radio broadcast? Not a whole lot. Not a whole lot while we were here in the States. Overseas, like on... Uh, That's on, what I meant, in Thailand, when you were in Thailand. Yeah, in Thailand you could run to uh, one of the movie theaters at certain times of the day and you could actually see uh, 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 bombing run tapes of where they dropped bombs on jungle or whatever. Uh, they would run the actual tapes for you for 45 minutes at a time. And then uh, you could get up and you go on on Guam, they, uh, you know, the, you had other things to do on Guam. You could go to a movie. The only trouble is, that, is that they had three movie houses. It's just that the first week they'd put it in the first movie house. The second week they'd go to the <laughs> second movie house, and the third move or the third week they'd go to the third movie house, and it would always be the same thing. You know, and once in a while they would get a different movie in. You know, but that was how it was done. So that's when I said uh, you pick up the, the habit of everybody drinks. They would have on Sunday mornings on Guam was good for, they had what they call the bush patrol. 
the guys would be out drinking on Saturday night, and they go around Sunday morning real early and look underneath all the bushes and so forth and drag out the drunks. <laughs> <laughs> They'd crawl underneath the bush and sleep. Did you form a tight companionship, com camaraderie with your your four airmen? Yes, they my my people. Uh, and how long did were were you? I together? worked with them at one time or another for the last couple of years. I may not have been the the crew chief, but right. I worked for them with, or with them. Um, Air Force has a bad habit of once in a while if they overpay you for going like overseas, travel pay or something, they'll take it back. Uh, and they'll give you every payday, they'll give you a five, check for $5. They figure that's enough to survive on. I had one guy, the guy from Georgia, and quite frankly, he they did that to him. They did it to me. And uh, he got to the point where he didn't want to do anything. He would crawl on the bottom shelf and sleep. And I couldn't find him one day. I looked at the whole building, the hangar over, trying to find him. I couldn't find him. And one of the guys says, don't bother him. He's over there sleeping. And I don't know whether maybe he got a second or a part-time job or something, working nights or something. I don't know. I figured it had to be something like that. Anyway, uh, I went to the container, rolled him out, grabbed him, and we had a uh, old tech sergeant that was uh, hell on wheels for everybody, giving everybody a hard time, always. And that was sat off. He's always uh, uh, Raisin cane, we were nothing but, you know, people, and that type of thing. Anyway, they put Sad off in charge of the floor. The the chief NCO for people on uh, engine maintenance, or engine mm -hmm. shop. So I rolled him out, I went in there, and he didn't like this young man very well anyway. But I told him, I said, I found him in a container of sleeping. And you could tell he just went cut, 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 torqued over. And his face turned red and and I said, and I don't blame him. One percent, a one iota. I said, I would do the same thing he did. I said, they are paying him five hours and they've been doing that for the past three months. You need to get some help. He just looked at me funny, and he got on the phone and he called the first sergeant for the squadron and told him what was going on. They sent him up there. They cut him a check for some cash so he could cover his needs for his wife and everything and uh, uh, sent the paperwork through to get everything straightened out. That was the only time that I ever had to go to a superior for one of my guys. And they more than earned whatever they they got. They got everything they wanted, everything they needed. They deserved the best. They they worked. They 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 presented themselves. Uh, they did their jobs correctly. They did everything they had to do. So yes, it was important to me that I did something. That at that point, okay, it just clicked inside of me, and something snapped, and I thought I had to do something. So I went, went, raising cane. Protecting your men. Yep. When yep. your crew would complete working on the engines, and you saw those B-52s taking off, could you describe to me the pride that you felt and the job that you have done in the in the contributions to the the war effort? Yes, uh, there's there's a being in the Air Force is an old uh, glitch. We didn't see combat. Uh, right, we didn't see combat. We saw results of combat. We saw uh, 
the tools used in combat. You ever see a B-52 that's fully loaded the tires on flattened down on the concrete or on pavement, and the next morning you see the same tail number sitting in the same spot and all these arming wires hanging down empty. You know those bombs went someplace, and someone paid a price for it. Hopefully it wasn't some wild monkeys in a tree somewhere, it was actually people that were doing it. And when they did a, when they did a bombing run, uh, did a rolling thunder, mm -hmm. that's what it was. Um, yeah, that makes you stop and think. It also, uh, the VFW over in Anderson where I go, there's a uh, prisoner of war guy over there. And he didn't care too much for Air Force people. He spent time in a camp. Anyway, uh, all I could tell him was that uh, I agreed with him. I didn't go to combat, but I could fire a rifle at uh, uh, 16. Matter of fact, I got a uh, expert citation for firing an M16. Uh, they had a ground controller a guy that they would fly in clean sheets for and food in front of uh, all these army guys and uh, he didn't didn't like that Air Force guy at all. I just figured, you know, I can see his point. The guy got special privileges, and he was doing out doing the, the fighting. But same token, my aircraft is the one he yells for when he wanted the bombs dropped to clean out a, a mess. Uh, my aircraft are the ones that fueled the fighters up and sent them in and gave him the strafing runs he needed, or the napalm. So, yeah, I felt pride. I still feel pride. It's like anything else. I went to the Air Force instead of coming to Ball State. Do you think I would today be happy if I had graduated from Ball State? Do you think I'd have special feelings toward Ball State if I had graduated from here? I have special feelings for the Air Force and the people I was with. I talked to some of those people on the telephone. I still call a couple of guys. I talked to other people who've been in war on the internet in California, in Florida, New Jersey, Michigan, Arizona, Denver. Uh, Denver, a guy named Knutson I worked with him at Ellsworth. He's been out there since he got out of the service uh, in 68. I still talk to him, I send him emails back and forth. I know him, uh, people, people I went to uh, school with, that one I was telling about that should, Mike Heathcote, I don't know if you've contacted him. He's an anthropologist, he taught He's a professor at the University of Guam for the last 20 years. He taught there. He just came home because of a family situation. And I've, me and a, a woman I graduated with, we've started every, the first Thursday of every month, we meet as a class at Frisch's and Anderson. So we can make contact, reconnect with some of the people we went to school with. And Mike showed up, uh, got, uh, uh, police detectives had shown up. I've got uh, a guy that used to be a, a raised king all the time. He's now a preacher. Uh, I even met a guy that graduated a year before us and graduated from here and became a teacher and he taught at the Air Force uh, uh, one, uh, in Colorado, the Air Force uh, yeah. School Academy, right. He also taught school in uh, Florida. His name is Ron McGregor. He and his wife now own a bed and breakfast in, Mar in Maine. I talk to him all the time. What about your four airmen? My four airmen? I wish I could find them. I've tried. I tried uh, 
About three years ago, I went to Chicago for three weeks on a special software school, uh, Pro ECAD software. And while I was up there, I tried to get a hold of uh, Hughes, find him. I also tried to find a guy named Kasparic. I also tried to find uh, Frank Casera, who used to be a tool maker or a machinist that made, uh, uh, helped make the machine that makes aluminum beer cans or mm -hmm. pop cans. He, they made the first ones. So. Given, what do you think of today's modern Air Force with the drones that they're using in Iraq and Afghanistan? and the technology advancements. I haven't thought about it too much. I know uh, it's like everything else, the computer's controlling it. Computer input, I use a computer. They're only going to be as good as the guy at the other end. On the, on the stick, I mean, uh, it's the same as a pilot. He may, uh, you know, he may not be uh, uh, Eddie Rittenbacker, but <laughs> well, he doesn't have to be either, you know. And they're they're using uh, it doesn't have to be a man either; it can be a woman. It could be running the uh, or flying it. I got a granddaughter. I've taken to Dayton to the Air Force Museum over there, and she said that she wanted to fly an F-16. I said, sure, all you got to do is study. You, anything you set your mind to, do it. And that's the way I feel. If you set your mind to it, you can do anything you want. The only limitations are the ones that you set on yourself. You've got to be able to uh, think farther, higher, better faster and uh, I didn't go back to school until mid 80s for CAD but after I left working for the state in 2004 the first time I went took classes for computer ITs IT I learned how to do networking and software so forth like that then I came back here and took more classes in CAD and grew not so much mechanical but architectural drafting. So I could uh, probably do, since the automotive industry is dead, I figured, well, maybe I can do something else. And I took advanced CAD classes. I took uh, uh, architectural classes from a guy that used to be the uh, city architect here in Lindsay and uh, still talk to him and different guys. And then after I got done with that, I started taking classes for Microsoft uh, software. I learned how to use Word, I learned how to use Excel, Access, uh, PowerPoint. Uh, the only thing I really haven't completed correctly yet has been Access, I've, I've used it. When you knew that you were gonna be getting out of the Air Force, returning home, what were your feelings? That's a whole other story. The reason I thought I was coming home to restart my life. I thought I was going to come home, work at GM, make money, like everybody else that was in my class. We all thought, oh man, we're through high school. I've completed now my military part. I've done what I need to do. I'm going to go home, make money, start my family, enjoy life, have me a new car, a new house. Uh, la, la, la. And then you find out that they don't want you because your hearing's too bad. They won't take you or hire you. And I found out that uh, the woman I had married at that time, back in 66, every time I had gone overseas <coughs> or something like that, she had found a boyfriend or something and 
yeah, we ended up getting a divorce, and that kind of put a stall on everything that felt good. Anyway, when I came home, I came home with the idea of starting my life over. Um, trouble is, the first thing I did was went back to the old routine of uh, working at Mars, finding old buddies, drinking and partying on weekends instead of exerting myself as I should have. The, what were the medals you received? The medals you received? Uh, Vietnam Service, Good Contact. Uh, there's a couple, three of them. Well, in my book there, I've got a copy of my 214. Uh, I said about three or four, basically that's it. I, I was a good boy. I didn't get my arm, arms or wrists smacked. And, and uh, I actually enjoyed my job greatly. It's the military part I didn't like, and the life there at the end of the military part that was messed up with that woman and her messing around with a couple of guys there in the jet shop, and then when she came home, she messed around with another guy here. Uh, so it, yeah, it, it spoiled a lot of things. Uh, I'm really, I'm currently reading a book by um, Russell, I believe it's Kennard, uh, Secret Service of the President. Anyway, it's, uh, he's, he's talked with the Secret Service agents that's been protecting the various presidents, and he and the one where they described uh, Johnson, which was the one in charge most of the time, you find out that uh, he was plastered most of the time he was president. He, there's a lot of good people that paid the ultimate price so he could uh, get drunk. That's not right. And the fact like that uh, he was no different than Kennedy. He chased women as much as Kennedy did. As a matter of fact, they had to wire a bell up between the, the personal quarters and the business quarters of the White House so that if his wife left the personal part, the Secret Service had to ring a bell and, and warn him down in the uh, business part in case he had a woman in his office messing around. Uh, that's not right. Of course, you had Nixon who were out without left field or out in Never Never Land somewhere, and you had uh, uh, Gerald Ford there, who's a Michigan uh, athlete. He was supposedly the best skier that they had to go out and hire an Olympic grade skier to go skiing with him so they could guard him because he could uh, ski backwards and shake his head at the Secret Service agents and say they were trying to catch him. And uh, his, his athletic abilities was, was, I know everybody made fun of him because he'd fall and trip and knock off balls around off people's head, but <laughs> he still was a good athlete, according to that book. I've... Uh, I've taken writing classes a few times the past few years. I've, been, I've discovered I enjoy doing that, I, which is what uh, some of the guys on the blogs and stuff that I go to, they, they tell me, uh, uh, you've got a way of writing and putting words together in a way that we enjoy. He said, we don't like to do it. So he said, go ahead, tell us what you think. <laughs> and then uh, uh, that, and I've started reading more books since I've, uh, I'm on disability, and uh, I've <clears throat> truly I've got into more conservative parts books, but I've also got into like uh, the Lone Survivor, which was uh, uh, that Navy SEAL that mm -hmm. survived in Afghanistan. 
uh, I read his story. Uh, there's one that's uh, uh, for the uh, uh, sniper, Marine sniper in Nam. The uh, well, I can't think of his name. I want to call it McCormick, but I don't think it is. Uh, what it took him three days once just to crawl across the field to get set up for a shot. I've got that book. I haven't had a chance to open it yet. I keep getting sidetracked on my own. I'm reading one now on on the thyroids also at the same time because I've got a thyroid lumps that they're looking at. Uh, I'm diabetic. I've got hearing loss. At least I pretty well work with the computer now, so I don't have to worry about being totally locked into a a, a, a quiet land. I'm slowly losing the rest of my hearing, I can tell that. When I go to sleep at night, there's, it sounds like there's a uh, a uh, tornado going outside all the time, which is a, a wind noise. That's telling me that uh, my tinnitus is getting worse, which means I'm going to lose the rest of it. It took them 35 years to finally admit that uh, I had a hearing loss, but they finally got around to help supplying me with... Uh, uh, hearing aids and batteries and stuff, and then I'm diabetic. The thyroid problem means I'm overweight. Uh, I have lost 35 pounds recently. I can I can lose weight, but then I drop down to a certain point and I stop and I can can't get any back. I want to uh, continue losing. But there's other things going on, and, and, uh, and uh, as a VA, it's just like the service, you uh, start with the top of the list and you work your way down, and it may take them six months to work from one item to the next. So, yeah, I'm I'm in a process. Uh, as far as uh, modern day warfare, war is still war. Somebody gets hurt, everybody pays. Uh, money or blood, there's really not that much difference. Uh, my grandson, I've got a grandson, I'd love to fly and I'd love to see him go to the Air Force Academy, but. Uh, I look at him and say, wouldn't you rather be a backhoe operator or something instead? I've got a granddaughter that said she wanted to fly an F-16, but I think she'd be smarter if she wanted to be an architect, which is something she likes. I got uh, two little grandsons. They're both like smart as whips. and. There are other, other grandfathers, a doctor. I'd like to see them follow his footsteps, but at the same time, I'm going to teach them everything I can about whatever they want to know. I, uh, I lost my firstborn when she was two and a half. I think because of uh, some of the engines I worked on, uh, were contaminated with something. I don't know for sure. I can't prove it. But uh, she had a birth defect when she was born, and uh, uh, she didn't survive. And then my body slowly bits and pieces going to bed. I'm, I don't have an open wound or scars to show, other than my own problems. Uh, my grandkids are all I got, and I want them to be as smart and as sharp as I can get them. And if that means teach them how to, to watch birds and see how they fly or watch a grasshopper jump, I've done that. I've taught them what a uh, wind chime is for and how to look at a windmill and how to read a windmill and stuff like that. And my, my, like I said, my grandkids are it.
Is there anything I haven't asked concerning your military service you'd like to discuss or address? No, I think we've, you've got me going and, and, <laughs> and I've filled up a couple of tapes apparently. So yeah, I, uh, only thing is, is uh, I said it, I'm disappointed in some of the bits and pieces of information that I've discovered, the way public officials used us and uh, abused us knowingly and unknowingly, some of them. Uh, I wish there was something I could do to help a lot of my brothers who need help. There's a lot that got, about a year ago I lost a good friend that had uh, post-traumatic. He'd went through about seven wives and about a case of beer every two or three days and uh, quarts of vodka over a case of them over a couple of weeks of GM vacation. And he worked two full-time jobs. And uh, he finally ended up drinking enough to where his immune system didn't exist. And he got uh, strep B and killed him in three days. And I knew him for 40 years. He'd give him the shirt off his back for the last, his last cold beer if he had it. But uh, that didn't add it one minute to his life. And there's a lot more like him. And there's going to be a lot more coming out of Afghanistan. There are even more coming now. They're filling up the VA and marrying the parking lots every morning. You can't find a place to park up there after 8 o'clock. You have to ride around for half an hour until somebody gets done and leaves to park. And the people they have working psychologists up there, they, they say, I'm, I'm depressed. They haven't seen me depressed yet. But uh, these people are coming back and their wives have actually... Uh, selling themselves for money and everything. And these guys are coming back with uh, uh, a lot deeper scars and hurt and pain than what I think my Air Force people had ever seen. I've seen a lot of combat people who got a lot deeper scars. But I've seen a lot of combat people too who, who still kept it together, whatever the reason. And uh, I wish I had the insight to be able to help them. And uh, trouble is, I'm not uh, a big shrink or a big physician or anything else. I I can drink cold beer with them and share the stories. And there's a lot of them out there. As many people as there are, uh, there's a lot of stories. Thank you. Thank you for what you did for our country. Thank you. I don't know if the, if the magazine kind of showed you the uh, little dolly and stuff. I don't they think do. it has any age model. Any pictures in there if you want to try and, Professor, if there's somebody that wanted, if he could, he has some great pictures like the other gentleman. Yeah. I've got about five and a half months. Okay. You want to uh, maybe try to get the. Can we try to get some of those? Sure, we'll Big pardon? Not, we're not borrowing anything for copying. Right. Um, okay, we're going to try and get uh, some of the pictures. Uh, if you could describe them to us for us. Oh. Yeah. Well, like I said, uh, This was the base in Thailand they were building it. These are the new barracks that they were building. This is what I was talking about, the ditch, the clung. Every wall of water, the drainage water goes in and all the drinking water comes out. Uh, Chow Hall. This is uh, what the Buddhist temple in a little town called Sadeb. 
Here's the Gulf, which was right beside in Saraib. Here's a bot bus, the, the old Datsun pickup. I bought with Thai money as a, as a nickel. And for a, a bot, they would take you from base to town. For a nickel. For a nickel. Their whole uh, economy was set up on, on bot. Uh, the smallest paper money they had was five baht or a quarter. Uh, these, like I said, are the uh, women that worked in the barracks and the hooches and so forth. They would polish the shoes and do the laundry and make the beds. This was a young lady who had a hard time with a lot of GIs. They, uh, she never crossed the line, but it wasn't because the guys weren't trying. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, I guess you could say this is, uh, the Thai version of, uh, Sam's Club. And this guy, <laughs> that's another guy from Alabama. Uh, he had a, uh, weakness for, uh, drinking and women downtown. And matter of fact, uh, he used to have this great big ring that was given to him by his family. Very decorative and, and uh, had a ruby under the ring. Anyway, the first week after payday, he'd be wearing it. The weekend after payday, it'd be gone. <laughs> the next payday, he'd suddenly be wearing it again. <laughs> he used it as collateral. <laughs> Here's here's the uh, KC-135 engines as lined up as in Thailand. Here is uh, Smitty, Jim Smith, a young guy. He was a staff sergeant. He worked in the same area I did. And uh, he caught me one day. I was losing it. And he told me, I told him, I said, uh, we're telling the guy, I said, I don't have rank. I don't know what this is. I'm not a staff sergeant. He was. Anyway, I didn't know it, but he was the one that was writing my evaluation. I soon made staff sergeant. <laughs> Here's this gentleman, name of Parks. He's from Ohio. Last I heard, he was working in Atlanta, down where Pratt and Whitney have their main manufacturing facility. Uh, I can say, yeah, as far as that's the kid here when I was uh, in there. And this is guy here that I uh, run with some in tech school. It's Peter A. DeTore out of Cleveland, Ohio. My family and me, this was in about 49 or 50. My mother, my aunt, and uncle. My mother, my dad in Newcastle, hmm. my dad's family, my aunt, and uh, uh, my uncle Robert was in uh, World War II, South Pacific. He's uh, in the Army. Uh, grandfather again. My grandmother I was telling you about was York. Uh, mm -hmm. You can tell Yorks because we all have big ears. <laughs> and that's how you, it was a trait that Alvin York had lots of. My grandfather and his father, and uh, let's see, that's my grandfather and I think some of the others. Here's uh, Thailand, this is a 52. Like I said, you can see some of the tail fins. They tend to be, look like uh, Sharks. Yeah. Smitty here is that's that staff sergeant. Sandy was from Greenville, Ohio. Uh, back when I was a kid, I don't know, used to go to Greenville all the time, drink a little three two beer, and <laughs> enjoy the party over there. He still, I don't know, I'm gonna chase him down one of these days. Another shot of uh, the shop. I said, that's, that's it on this, the other pictures and stuff I yeah, have Yeah, there's here. that one picture of your crew that 
Yeah, about a minute. Yeah. yeah. This is my, uh, in Albany, this is my grandfather, great-grandfather. These are Civil War veterans. Um, wow. I don't think he fought for the South either, for, <laughs> for Kentucky. I think, uh, actually, he was a Union guy. <laughs> yeah. That picture of your your crew you showed me. Oh, uh, yeah, for right. No, uh, this is this is a tech school grad picture, with over Chanute. Uh We had an instructor, and we had uh, had a guy from Minnesota farm boy. 